Welcome. Welcome to Awards 2 and 3 MPA, Neighborhood Planning Assembly. Uh, my name is Kevin Duderman. I'm from Ward 2. I'm part of the steering committee. Um, and here we have our uh, trustee, Charlie G. Um, and who else in the Zoom lobby is here? I see, uh, I see Tony, but would you mind uh, unmuting and saying hello? Tony? Uh, any other steering committee members uh, that can hear me want to say hello and just introduce themselves? I'm not sure who's, who's online right now. I can't see. I can't hey, Kevin. see. I can't it's see. It's Jeff Hyman, Ward 3 Steering Committee. Hello. Barbara McGrew, Ward 3. Hi, everybody. Hey, Barbara. What are you running to Ward 3? Beautiful. Anybody else? Hi. Hello. You good? That's it. Um, so, uh, just an announcement. Uh, the NPA grant process timeline is uh, on the horizon. Um, the RFP release will be on November 23rd. Uh, there will be dis a discussion about it um, at the December 9th NPA. Um, applications will be due on December 31st, and presentations will be at the January 13th meeting. We're uh, trying to get ahead of the curve here this year. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, were we supposed to be hearing that? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't understand it. This is to everybody. Sorry, I know I'm okay. kind of facing this way, but like it's yeah, to everybody. Okay. Yeah, we have people on the Zoom call and also over here, so sorry. Uh, 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 oh, I thought it was You said something's going to happen sometime and there's going to be a something. It's a request for proposals under our. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so I can go into a little bit more detail. So uh, every year we have a budget. Um, previously, oh. uh, a few years ago, it was only like $400 a year. So it was like, we didn't really have much money to play with. Um, but for the last two years, we've gotten $2,500 per, per award. So we actually have some, some money to play with, and we, we elicit. Who's we? Uh, the NPA, the, the steering committee, and the, the everybody. Everybody who comes here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so we, we put the word out and say, hey, if you have an idea to like, you know, make an event or some kind of service that would, that would you know, serve the community, you know, apply to to you know, get some funds, and um, it's a it's it's a, it's a grant. It's it's from the city funds that you know it, it supports local uh, local action. Uh, so that's that's the timeline I just read out. So it's. Um, it's, it's coming up. There'll be, there'll be more talk about it in, in, in next month's meeting. That's all. Um, and so, yeah, the next meeting will be December 9th. Um, recordings can be found on YouTube or on CCTV's website. And that's it for announcements. Uh, from now, we'll go to public forum. Uh, if any public would like to forum, uh, Please raise your hand using the Zoom uh, feature and also in the room here. Um, we ask that you try and keep it uh, two minutes or less. Um, so yeah, raise your, raise your hands now and uh, we'll have our, our CEO rep uh, you know, call on you and, and be the delegator there. Any, any questions first in the, in the in-person audience here? Any, any, no, not questions, public forum, any public forum? All right. Uh, no takers here. Ethan, any uh, takers in the So we have two hands raised from one from Tony Reddington and one from Megan Humphrey. Yeah, take your pick. So uh, Tony, if you want to mute, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's interesting. I think we all. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Okay. Um, I think. I think you all know that uh, today uh, uh, Vermont made it to number eight highest in the country with COVID, and our numbers of COVID cases in the state are uh, off the charts compared to anything we've had in the past. So uh, please mask. Uh, please uh, be careful who you meet with, with uh, without masks, and, and act accordingly. Um, I, I, on the uh, on the agenda today is a discussion. 
of, of crossing guards. And, uh, I, people, may, people may not be aware, but being a crossing guard is a very, very dangerous occupation. And uh, uh, it seems like a do-gooder activity, but uh, uh, there, there, there are crossing guards killed every you know, a week or two across the country. It's a very dangerous uh, activity. And I sat uh, and watched the crossing guard at North Street and North Champlain houses down that were just uh, high in the woods uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that is a, that is one, it's a high crash intersection. Uh, it's very unsafe for pedestrians. And I would not ask anybody for any anomaly to be a crossing guard at that location. Uh, my most frightening intersection, by the way, is, is uh, Elon Allen Parkway and, and uh, North Avenue. Uh, and uh, that, that is, uh, uh, that's a Friday the 13th the type of intersection. I, I do not, I would not suggest anybody become a, uh, a crossing guard uh, for any amount of money. And I would ask that the Department of Public Works begin to uh, install roundabouts and other traffic calming techniques to make uh, North Street, which is probably the least safe community street in Vermont, uh, a safe street to walk on. The, the, the discrimination against people who walk is notorious and, and we, we just should not put up with it anymore. Uh, so be careful when you ask people to be crossing guards. Uh, be, be first concerned about their safety. Uh, and clearly the city and uh, the school department has not been strong in this area, in particular the DPW. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Someone else here? Uh, yeah, Maggie Humphrey has her hand up. Uh, you can go. Go ahead, Maggie. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Megan Humphrey. I am the executive director of HAMS, and Jess Hyman is also helping us out hugely. But we are um, going to be distributing about a thousand meals and gift bags all over the county on Christmas Day. So we would, um, these are for seniors, so it's for folks 50 years and over, as well as their households and families um, if they all live together. So I just wanted to let folks know, and the website that has all the information about um, having seniors sign up for the meal delivery, it includes the whole county, so we're encouraging people to sign up through AgeWell. And all of that information is on our website, as well as how you can help in terms of donating for the gift bags or giving a financial contribution, which would be very welcome. Um, so that is at handsvt.org, and folks can just check the website there, and thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, we also have a hand raised from Jess Hyman. Go ahead, Jess. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement to make sure that folks know about the Vermont Tenants Hotline through CBOEO. Uh, as I'm sure folks have seen in the news over the past week um, with the story about um, uh, problems with, with uh, some of the larger landlords in, in the city and the plight of a lot of renters. Um, I, there are some really excellent resources for renters available and one of them is through CBOEO. Um, and there's a hotline that people can call um, if you're a renter and if you're experiencing any challenges in your in your in your rental, or if you have questions about your lease or, or facing illegal discrimination, you can call the Vermont Tenants Hotline at 802-864-0099. Um, once again, that's the Vermont Tenants Hotline through CBOEO, 802-864-0099. Beautiful. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, also, uh, sorry everyone, I forgot to start the recording, so I'm going to start it now. Um, just so everyone knows. Recording in progress. <laughs> All right. Um, at least we have it on uh, yeah, a different video source. Would be all right. Um, yes, any, uh, any other public forum? Any other hands? Ethan? Nope, okay. Um, last chance. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item, uh, the steering committee elections. We've got two new folks that are interested and uh, they're up for election. Uh, we have Mayumi uh, Cornell and Chris Hasley. Uh, sorry if I butchered either of those names, I'll learn them. Um, uh, have you uh, just introduced yourselves, uh, Mayumi? You, you start. 
Hello, my name is Abby. I live in Warren Street on Willow Street. Um, I don't know what else would you like to know. <laughs> uh, what, you know what got you interested in the MBA? Um, I've been going to, the, I was going to the dinners before, obviously before COVID, um, and I've just gotten more um, politically active as I've gotten older because I've gotten very frustrated by some of the um, some of the policies and politics that can be them playing that so I'm hoping to make a difference. All right. Excellent. Um, Chris, same question. Hey, I'm Chris. I live uh, downtown on College Street. I uh, lived in Burlington for over 20 years, five years at my current address. I uh, just wanted to get a little bit more involved uh, with the community and try to get more folks involved here with the uh, Neighborhood Planning Assembly. It's uh, our voice here in this uh, city. So, uh, yeah, that's basically my, uh, my motivation. And thank you, uh, Andrew uh, Champagne, for kind of getting me interested. Right on. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, let's start with, with uh, Ward 2. Everyone from Ward 2, uh, I need either a yay or an a nay, and I'll, I'll call the yays first. Um, so everyone who uh, votes yay for uh, confirming or electing uh, Miami uh, to the steering yay. committee. You can also raise your hand, you can do, you know, just signal in some way. Um, you know, it could be voice, it could be anything. Text, we have uh, someone, someone uh, watching that. Okay. And then nays. Any nays? Which which board now? This is a uh, this is for Miami, so it's board two. Okay. Any nays from board two? Is that none? All right. So uh, it's unanimous. Welcome, Miami. Um, and now it's to uh, Chris with board three. Um, so, same thing, everyone from Ward 3 can vote in this one. Um, uh, everyone, everyone yay? Just make some sort of signal. Yay. Yay. Yes. Yay. Yay. Awesome. Uh, nays? Alright, hearing none. Welcome, Chris. Uh, thank you both for uh, being interested in, in, you know, Joining our ragtag group. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. Uh, moving on. So, um, the ad hoc redistricting public input survey and meetings. Uh, we got George Love and Dan Monto. Montano. Yeah. Uh, we got Dan here in, pers in person. <coughs> is, uh, is, is George uh, online here? Look like George is on right now, but I don't mind sharing my screen and uh, kind of giving everyone an update on and upcoming meetings that uh, we're gonna have. So now I did. Oh, it looks like screen sharing is disabled though. Sweet. All righty, guys. Do. Could everyone online see it? Can we get it on the screen so we can see it? Unfortunately, it's not true. It's audio only. Well, here, we could put it right in between us and we can both look at it. All right, so I'm Dan, I live in Ward 3, and I'll be giving the update on the Ad Hoc Redistricting Committee. So what this committee was uh, set up to do is it was set up by the city council by resolution to include representation from all of the, word, uh, all of the wards across the city and sort of have an independent voice um, to give, I guess, a voice to all of the citizens in how the uh, ward map is gonna be uh, redrawn, uh, which needs to be done basically every time there's a deviation in the population between the wards that exceeds a certain level. 
And not only that, uh, the idea is to also compare uh, different systems, including the previous system, where there was just wards and multiple representatives uh, in the wards, and also the current system, where we have districts overlaid um, over two wards, essentially. So the way that the committee is going to go about this is through public meetings. So uh, the initial plan was to have two public meetings. That's what was written in the city council resolution. Uh, but since the timeline has sort of been extended, we're going to be having three public meetings. And the first one already occurred on November 1st. And the actual like uh, turnout was a little lower than we expected. But we hope that people could join us online and I'll talk about the dates in just a little bit. There'll be one on November 17th, I think, and then another on December 6th. So also we plan to have a survey that we're gonna distribute um, both on Front Porch Forum and just give people uh, other ways to give input um, uh, with their thoughts on this. So uh, the updated timeline uh, that CEDO and I guess the city agreed on was to report back to city council with a formal report sometime in January. And the idea is beyond that point, city council could work on this as well as the map drawers um, to get the actual final plan on the ballot for November 2022. So there was a number of considerations and it seems that we might have some time for discussion. So if anyone has any ideas, about this now, or you could also contact uh, me or George via email, um, sort of what, you know, what we ought to consider um, when we're drawing these districts and giving our recommendation, which, which is just that, just a recommendation to the city um, based on public input. I have a question. Yeah. I don't know if it's getting recorded. I, I think it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you give us an idea of where um, people have moved. In other words, which wards have lost people, which ones have gained people? Yep, so I'd be happy to share that, that information with everyone, but uh, by and large, the biggest changes were in wards uh, 1 and 8, and the biggest loss, I think, were in the two new North End wards. So the majority of wards did grow a number, but the biggest growth was actually um, in ward 1. Okay. And actually, I have a, a bar chart, which I could actually add sort of as a supplementary slide on here um, with some more information about where the population is actually changing. And obviously, if we stick with eight wards, um, really, um, those change, you know, those, those are really the boundaries that are going to change in terms of the specific sort of like map components. And are we considering more than eight wards or less than eight wards? Uh, yes, so actually if you go to the potential considerations, one of them is actually at-large city councilors, which is certainly something that people have you know, strong opinions about, but um, yeah, also the number of wards is, is something that we could um, consider as, as well. So I'm eager to hear people's thoughts, but like I mentioned, these are going to be the two upcoming uh, public input meetings, November 17th and December 6th, and you could participate uh, either on uh, Zoom or in person at these two places, both named the Miller Center. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mentioned the survey component, so we hope to have that ready. Um, and there you could find more information about what these considerations mean and sort of what the trade-offs are um, in, in between these um, different things we could consider. Uh, I have some more links, so there is the redistricting committee website on the city, and also on the city's website you can see um, the current ward map, the previous ward maps, as well as the, the maps that were under consideration the last time the, the districts were uh, redrawn. So you'll see like from the initial input um, from the redistricting committee to the one that was finally approved and went into place in 2015, um, that there were actually a number of changes. So. The idea here is to have a more public process um, where it's clear you know, where the public stands before we go on to these later stages and actually drop the map. Cool. It looks like we have some hands in the Zoom room. Yep, so if you want to... Uh, just pull it right out of there. Just pull it right out of there. Straight out. Um, I, I, uh, uh, the 
survey. When is that now on front porch forum? So I can apply for it, open for it. Uh, it's probably going to be over the next few weeks, so probably after that November 17th meeting where uh, the committee members could actually meet in person and chat with the public um, about you know, what information we're really going to have on there. But in the meanwhile, I'll be putting up some posts on the Old North End forums, so if there's any specific things, um, you know, sort of how people feel about the way the districts are drawn here in the Old North End. I'd also love to hear sort of more specific input beyond the broader considerations um, in, in the way the, the actual like, ward and the system is going to be drawn up. I'm wondering if you can share it with the downtown front porch forum since Ward 3 yes. has yeah. a lot of people in downtown. <laughs> I think I actually have access to all of the front porch forums <laughs> in Burlington, so it's many more emails I get a day now. <laughs> Uh, any, any other questions in the, in the audience? No? All right. Thank you, Dan. Great. All right, moving on to the next item. Uh, crossing guard planning with uh, Dan Hill. Is, is Dan present? Yes, I am present. Uh, I am on my wife's computer at Twice History, so I do apologize about that. <laughs> All good. So I want to thank you folks for letting me be on here. Uh, City of Burlington Traffic Division, and we are short around 15 crossing guards. And I didn't know if I could reach out to you guys and not uh, help us in any way. Uh, ships are about 50 minutes apiece, 7.30 to 8.20 in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, 2.35 to 3.20 in the afternoon except for on Wednesdays at 140 to 320. Uh, the rate of pay is 34 a day, which equals 171.47 a week. Uh, the city does supply the safety clothing, top panel, and we will trade anybody who wants to do this. Um, the, and there is a background check that is required. It's a federal and state background check. And plus, we have to do a hearing and eye test. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is dhill at burlingtonpt.gov. Um, that's pretty much all I have. I do appreciate your time to let me do this. So thank you. And uh, if anybody can help, we're looking for people. Beautiful. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we, have a, we have a question in the audience here for you. So Dan, are th do you know of any openings in wards two or three, or do you just like somehow lump them all together? Oh, uh, we're, I, I don't know exactly where the boards are, where's two and three? Um, it's every, uh, well, I, I could explain it, but basically it's the old north end. It's everything from Battery Park all the way up to uh, Winooski Avenue and everything from like King Street all the way out to the Intervale. Yes, I probably have a... So in other words, it's well, Wheeler School, it's the Sustainability Academy, it's the um, Arts Integrated Arts Academy. It's the high school. And, it's and the high school. Yes. I, yeah, as of right now, I have, I believe, one, two, three, four, I probably have four to, four to five in those wards that are open right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. You're welcome. Any other questions in the audience? Uh, yeah, Tony. Uh, uh, Tony, go ahead. I, I, I appreciate your bringing this out and, and, and letting people know about the, uh, the crossing, crossing guard issue. Well, it, this is this really has nothing to do with you. You're not responsible for the safety of these intersections. But uh, uh, intersections like the, the one at North Street and North Champlain, uh, which serves as Sustainability Academy, is, yeah. is one of the high crash intersections uh, uh, in, in Vermont. And, and there's generally, unfortunately, uh, Burlington has not addressed the pedestrian safety anywhere. And nowhere is that more apparent and more concerning if you're a parent uh, then then obviously uh, our kids born in school i was always sort of puzzled why so many people on north street walk their kids to school 
I, I understand now because it's not a safe street. Those intersections are, are very dangerous uh, uh, at heart. And, and that, uh, uh, for example, there's no crossing in front of the state of Academy at Murray Street. There should be a, a crossing in a, in a, a either roundabout or some kind of traffic calming there. So I, I would ask you to just take the message back to their citizens and are really concerned about uh, uh, not only safety for kids, but uh, we, we, need, uh, we, need, we need intersections that are safe for, for these uh, crossing guards. Uh, I hate putting people in arms away, whether it's kids or, or crossing guards, even part-timers. Uh, and I've observed uh, uh, the, the gentleman who does the one that at uh, uh, North Street and, and North uh, uh, Champlain also uh, experienced firsthand what it's like to try to cross at Eden Hill Parkway and uh, North Avenue, which is, which is a terror. It's like being in the middle of a terror attack to go across there with cars yeah. coming at you from all directions. Thanks. I, and I agree with you 100%. I, mean, I, I have little kids and I understand the feelings. You know, I, I don't. I wouldn't want my little guys to walk through here, so I understand exactly what you're saying. But I will definitely talk to people in my office. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your time, people. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, thank you for being here. All right. Uh, that brings us to our, our next item. Uh, Chief Murad is here in person. Um, Chief, this is the mic that feeds into the camera. Okay. Uh, so I ask you to sit here. Um, this is just feeding to general Zoom room, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, take it away. Okay. Um, may I remove this to speak or? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, for, for those of you here. Um, and uh, for those who are watching, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. It's, I'm, I'm sort of sad to see it, you know, it's, it's a small group, but I understand. My daughter just got her, her vaccination. She's 10, um, and so she got hers, and uh, I, I'm waiting to get my booster. Uh, it's obviously, you know, we're slowly coming back, I think. Uh, we were at a, a Ward 5 NPA um, last week. I was at a Ward 5 NPA last week. It was really wonderful to, to be with folks again. The week before that, the Flynn had reopened and had a really terrific event. And, and the feeling of, of things coming back, I think, is, is very important. Um, and so that was terrific. I brought a presentation, uh, and it's, it's not insubstantial, but I don't know exactly how it's going to be shown to everyone. I know it's, uh, it's on the computer there, but I'm not certain how it would work. Um, it can't be projected clearly, so I don't know what the plan is exactly. Yeah, sounds like he's on it. He has the file. Yes, I gave it to him on a thumb. He's got it. Um, we'll share it in the Zoom audience and see it, but we just, you know, we'll all be able to see it. I'll do my best to describe it to, to everybody. Um, I'll, I'll say, since you guys can't see it, I'll simply say that it is the greatest PowerPoint ever made. It is really <laughs> fabulous, and uh, um, you, will, you would be awed by it if you could see it. It would be, there would be tears and, and just... It's just um, It'd be like being in the Vatican. There'd be <laughs> Italian guards shouting silencio and just demanding that you take it in in, in silence. Um, so I'll, I'll start with it and I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll try to, to move through it in a way that makes it uh, sort of apprehensible for everyone here as well. Uh, it, the first slide is just a picture slide and the next slide shows our incidents and the categories of incidents. So back in May, we had to implement something that I created and have called the Priority Response Plan. And the Priority Response Plan takes the 130 call categories or incident categories that we track in our system, Valcor, and divides them into priority ones, priority twos, and priority threes. And the first slide is, is a grounding in that. It shows all 130 categories and it color codes them uh, in order to show the, the ones that are priority one, those are the most serious, the kinds that have life safety implications, uh, the priority twos, uh, pri a robbery would be priority one. A mental health call is a priority two. Depending on how it's described, it could, it, it might have a life safety component. It might not. And then priority threes, uh, which are incredibly important but are not life safety important, um, they are quality of life issues like noise complaints, like traffic complaints, and and those really make a community feel the way a community wants to feel. And yet, if we have uh, a Diminished headcount, which we do, 
Um, and if we have increasing volume, it's much lower than it has been in previous years, but it's getting higher than it was last year. And again, because the uh, number of officers available is, is so much smaller than it has been, we had to make tough decisions about what we were going to go to or not. And at any given time, we may be implementing this model. What the model says is that if I have two or fewer officers available for response, we will not go to those priority threes and most priority twos. And instead, we will keep those two officers available in case a priority one comes along, a domestic violence incident that needs a two officer response, that kind of thing. There are other times of day where we still do priority threes, uh, et cetera. It, it's all about the staffing availability. And staffing is, is hard. We used to have as many as the high, we would have in the high 50s available for our patrol response. Um, and that doesn't count our airport, and that doesn't count our detective bureau. But we would have in the high 50s non-supervisory sworn officers available for patrol. We currently have fewer than 30. And as a result, that's stretched across the whole clock uh, and across all three shifts. It gets very small very fast. So that incident uh, chart is, is, an, is one way of grounding the discussion. The, the next slide shows the incident volume year to date uh, as of November 10th, yesterday, uh, for 2017, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And incident volume has plummeted. Overall incident volume is drastically down. Um, and uh, it, is, it went from 29,000 in 2017. It is currently at 19,000 in 2021. And those are both year to date numbers. So that was as of November 10th back in, uh, in 2017. Um, that's a big drop. Uh, I, I also have another category of June 1st through November 10th, and the reason I have that is because I wanted to talk about how often we've had to stack calls. And that plan that I implemented, that priority response model, involves stacking calls when, when officers can't respond. Um, we stack about 15% of calls for service that come in. So that's the, the overall average, about 15%. Um, with regard to that huge plummet, that 35% that decrease from 2017 through, 29, uh, through 2021, excuse me, um, half of it comes from traffic stops and from foot patrols. Officers are not doing traffic stops. Officers are not doing as many foot patrols. And so that, that decrease in proactive officer activity accounts for more than half of the overall decrease in incident volume. And that's important because what it says is that our neighbors aren't calling us any less. Uh, well, they are, but not as much less as it looks. Uh, and then the, the next slide is a picture of what we call priority one incidents, those priority ones we talked about. And priority one hasn't changed at all. So even as we see overall incidents plummet and go very far down, the priority ones are actually higher in 2021 than they have been in any year since 2017. They're higher than last year, than 2019, than 2018. And, and that is a, is a challenge because, again, we have many fewer officers to deal with those. The next slide is about use of force. It's a very important topic. It is uh, a rarely used uh, police power, but it is among the most important in the stakes involved and the responsibility that it entails. Um, our use of force is lower this year than it has been in any year since last year, and is barely above last year's numbers. Uh, it's, we've drastically trended that down over the past several years. And a component of that is, is, uh, is you know, a change in officer posture, things that we have done with regard to emphasizing de-escalation in our use of force policy and our training procedures. I have a slide of, of some selected incident trends, but it's a whole bunch of trends. And it, it too is, is year to date, although it, it's through October 25th. I couldn't update it to October to November 10th. Um, I have to run each one of those categories each, for the, each year, and it takes time. But it's through October 25th, and there's several categories. There's aggravated assault and simple assaults and burglaries and mental health calls and incidents of, of vehicle theft. and um, the ones that, are, that, are, that really stand out in there is, is aggravated assault is higher than it's ever been in the city, at least in the past, since 2017. I shouldn't say ever been. I'm saying in the, in the frame of these slides, um, the past five years. Burglary uh, is, is lower than it was in 2017, but higher than it is than it's been in all the other years since. And it's really above last year's numbers. Uh, mental health calls have gone high as well, very high for mental health calls. So we're seeing these kind of overdoses, sadly, overdoses after a good deal of progress that was made on overdose, the pandemic stole our focus on and progress on the epidemic. 
And as a result, um, we're seeing these, these things. And a lot of these just swirl together with regard to being social phenomena, with regard to being phenomena of stress, with regard to being phenomena that, that make our community feel more tenuous and less safe and, uh, and a, just a little bit um, different than we've known it in the past. You know, I, I, was, I was born here in Burlington. Um, my parents taught at the university for, for 35 years on my dad's part. Um, I left for a long time. I worked for a long time in the New York City Police Department. I did two years in the private sector, took a 60% pay cut to come back to public service and back to this community because I love this community. My wife and kids and I live in the New North End. We are part of this community. I feel it too. I feel the changes that we're experiencing and they feel it's different than anything. I, I, I remember a similar kind of, uh, of, of swing in the very early 90s. And we had some, some changes and transitions and there was a sense of, of something slipping from us at that point. Um, and, and it worries me. Uh, I have a slide on traffic disparities. Um, that has been a big issue for us. It is one that, you know, as I said, traffic stops are, are really down. They're down more than 86% since 2016. Uh, but this year, Year to date, we have eliminated traffic disparities. So we have, um, we are, are, are pulling black drivers over at a smaller rate than their presence in the driving population. And we are issuing tickets at an even sl a smaller rate than that. Crash data tells us that black drivers are about 8% of the driving population. We have had about 7.2% of our stops be of black drivers this year. Um, of, the, of the tickets issued, of all tickets issued in any stops, 5.6% of tickets were issued to black drivers. So we made some real progress in this and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue it. I'm hopeful it will, it will hold through the end of the year. Um, and uh, I think that's a good thing. We did not see, we had seen a, a increasing parity with regard to the, the percentage of stops versus the percentage of drivers as measured by crash data. We lost that last year. Uh, they split apart in a bad way, um, but this year they've crossed and actually there are fewer stops of black drivers than there are black drivers in the driving population as per crash data. So that's a good thing. Um, we still have other disparities. We have disparities in arrests. We have disparities in use of force. Those are things that we want to examine. We always want to uh, try to figure out where those are coming from. One thing that I have done in the past year is I have made every single use of force public. We put every single use of force in a written document that goes online and is shared with the police commission that we used to read it out loud to the police commission but they frankly got tired of hearing it I think because it took a long time to read and, and one of the things that is m very important to me about that is that I want the public to be able to look and try to determine whether we see patterns. We clearly see numerical patterns. We see these disparities. The question is, where does the disparity come from? Is the disparity automatically indicative of bias? I do not believe so. I don't see that as I examine the incidents on a granular level. And so being able to share that with the public so the public can examine it themselves as well is important. And to that end, I have a job description out for hiring a redaction specialist mm -hmm. So that I can, in addition to putting out all of these uses of force in a narrative sense, I can have a redaction specialist so that we can put every single body camera of a use of force out to the public and post every single one proactively, preemptively, and let the public look and decide. Um, at this point in the, in the slideshow, I, I get to some pictures of our officers and our demographics of our officers and our hiring over the past many years. Um, we are, uh, you know, we need to, we, we're, we're not, you know, as the, the whole profession doesn't do a good enough job of bringing women in. We do a slightly better job than the profession as a whole. Um, it's something that I've, uh, I want to focus on. I haven't been allowed to hire for two years, so uh, I hired my very first officer um, in this past month, in October. First officer in almost two years. Um, ah, there's some, great, so some people can see them in the room anyway. Uh, you know, what the, the two pictures are, um, on the, the two pie charts on the right-hand side of the screen, the pie chart that is to the left shows our current demographics by race of the BPD, the 69 total sworn officers we currently have. That's all officers. That's myself, that's supervisors, that's sworn officers. We have 69. Normally, we were authorized for 105 and we would have about 96 to 97. That was our normal number. We currently have 69. 
Um, that's their demographics. And then next to it are the demographics of the city, of Burlington. And uh, there's some categories that, need, that we could uh, you know, be stronger in. But overall, with regard to uh, just white versus people of color, we're pretty much in line with the city. What we're not is with, with certain demographic groups there. And that's going to be a focus as we begin to hire again, now that we are allowed to hire again. The city council changed its, rule, uh, its decision from, from June of 2020, in which they limited the department to, they cut it by 30%, not by, not by layoffs, thank goodness, but by attrition. And the officers got the hint, and officers left in droves, much, much higher numbers than we've ever seen. And that's what this next slide shows. Um, which is our in and out since 2015. And, and any agency, unless it gets bumps or, or is allowed to hire more or told to hire less, any agency's object is to try to bring in as many as it loses each given year. You want to achieve headcount homeostasis, to use sort of the, the fancy words for it. And that headcount homeostasis, we had it pretty good. Uh, there were years where we were a little up, a little down. Obviously, the past two years, we have seen drastic decreases. Um, we weren't allowed to hire, and also officers felt unsupported. They felt that this was not a place where they were going to be able to have a long-term career, and they left. And the next slide shows that visually um, with this big cliff that, that leads us from June 2020 down to November of 2021. And that one little bump at November 2021, which is that one officer I've brought aboard. Now, our next police academy, he's in the police academy right now. He's a street outreach worker that we were able to, to bring over to the police department. That's great. We want people who have that kind of ethos, that, that uh, kind of ethos about uh, mental health and social work, etc. cetera. Um, we're hopeful to be able to get two or three officers into the next police academy that starts in February. Uh, it normally starts in February this year. It'll probably start more like March or April because the, the current academy should have started in August but started in, in October instead. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to lose more officers. I'm losing more officers to the Vermont State Police. I'm losing officers to retirement. I will continue to lose more officers than I can bring aboard for at least the next year. And then I can try to ach achieve this, this stasis again, and then I can try to grow. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, the next slide shows uh, some ideas for that, and ideas of which the mayor is supportive to bring in a recruiting specialist, to bring in a, a public a PIO or a public information officer, someone who can help us tell our story, not only to our community, not only inside the agency to increase morale and keep the officers that we have, um, but also further away, farther away rather, uh, to try to get people to come in. Right now, I have been robbed by a number of neighboring agencies. South Burlington has taken a couple of very good officers from us. Um, the state is, is facing some of these same problems. They weren't, no other community in the state was defunded the way the Burlington Police Department was, but all agencies in the state are having a hard time holding on to officers and recruiting new officers. One path for us is to go farther and get people from other states to come to our community. And that would be, uh, you know, a, a communication specialist would be very helpful for that. The next slide shows some ideas about recruiting plans. Um, including working with AALV, working with Think Vermont. I have I put the uh, BPD in a, in a program called 30 by 30, even though I wasn't allowed to hire at the time, I joined it because it's about bringing, the, the goal is to get the profession to 30% women. Um, and the, the profession overall around the country, I think is about 11% female. The BPD is, is in the high teens, I think 19. If I look only at the past several years, it's higher than that. Um, but 30% is the goal of this program, and I'm proud to belong to that program. We were the first agency in the state to do it, and after us, the VSP in South Burlington and some others joined as well. And then the last slide, um, which is our progress already for recruiting, and, and it's some photos of us swearing in new positions. Now, I created something called the Public Safety Continuity Plan uh, back in January. Actually, we created it last year, almost as soon as the defunding happened. I don't know if anybody here has ever seen Moneyball, and, and Moneyball has this terrific scene where they're talking about, or read the book, terrific scene where they're talking about the fact that, uh, that they lost, the Oakland A's lost Giambi, right? They lost Eric Giambi, one of their best players, and how are they going to create him? Well, how are they going to get another one? They couldn't. There is no such thing. But we create him in the aggregate, right? And they, they learn about, the, it's sort of, there's all, there's about statistics in a way that I'm not uh, about, but what I had was a situation where I wasn't going to be allowed to hire officers, 
the community or portions of the community had said very clearly they didn't want as many officers, particularly sworn armed officers. What could we do instead? The public safety continuity plan was a way of addressing that, to bring in more what we call community support liaisons. Actually, not more. We created that position. Community support liaisons, experts in mental health, in substance use disorder, in houselessness, and then also to bolster an existing position that we had called the community service officer, unsworn, not armed, not capable of making arrests, but capable of issuing municipal tickets, capable of, of addressing certain kinds of quality of life issues, and expanding that role and expanding the headcount of it. And that plan is a way for us to be able to get uh, back to a, a strength that we need to serve our community faster. Officers take much longer to hire. They take longer to hire and longer to train. Community service officers, CSOs, and CSLs don't. I've already hired all the CSLs I was allotted by the police, uh, by the, excuse me, the city council. And I'm allotted 10 CSOs. I haven't gotten that number. I've got two hired and two in background. I'm hopeful to have the five that I'm allotted by the end of this fiscal year. But that's an important growth period, a place for us as well. And so I'm really happy about that, that here we are in November. We've got two ready to go. They're, all, they're almost solo on the road. We've got all the CSLs. They've been instrumental already in working with the houseless population that's in Sears Lane. Um, and doing that in a different way. We have not had to have any enforcement encounters in Sears Lane. The police have not done anything in Sears Lane. And that's important. And so these moves are, are a way for us to, to, to grow from what has been, certainly from the police department's perspective, an incredibly difficult 18 months. Incredibly difficult. The day that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, the Burlington Police Department was facilitating the largest food drive that Chittenden County ever saw or has seen. We shut down the entire belt to do it. And we worked with the Vermont National Guard and the Vermont Food Bank. That is the kind of police department that this community has. Flaws, things to ch improve, things to grow from, sure. But we already had the kind of police department that communities across the country were clamoring for. And in clamoring louder than those communities did, we have hurt that department. We have rendered it less effective than it used to be. And our community is sensing that now with regard to certain kinds of car, uh, categories of incident and, and a feeling that this community has. How we reverse that is, is, is this. And, and there is a path forward, but it's going to take everybody working together to do it. And I've spoken long enough, and I'll, I'll you know, turn it over to, to questions, whether from the audience or, or from the Zoom audience. And thank you very much, everyone, for having me. All right, we got a question from Dan. Hey, sorry, it took me so long to get it up. It only no, worked no. on like Google Slides. But my question is going back to the racial disparities in use of force. So even though the actual total number of incidents is going down, yes. the actual disparity is going up. So you mentioned earlier that you don't think bias is playing a role. What is the cause of this disparity? So. I think that what we see with regard to arrest, um, and then with regard, so arrests are, are disparate compared to the population. Um, but each time we get into a category of arrest that involves either violence or less officer discretion, the disparity grows. So in other words, the places where officer discretion is highest, the disparity is the least. The, dis the places where the officer discretion is, is the least, the disparity is the highest. And that includes uses of force. Uses of force are driven by the behavior that an officer encounters. Um, and, and when we see that they're not, when we see that it's incidents that officers have created, we discipline accordingly. But uh, the, the ones that we have shared with the police commission, for example, the police commission has not flagged these. Um, there, there have been instances that we've had discussions with the police commission. There have been specific incidents. Uh, but overall, the, the ones that we uh, have put out to the public, and the public can see them too, um, no, I do not find bias in those. I do not find examples of, of this wouldn't have happened but for the fact that the identity of the people involved is X or Y. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, my, that's my big rationale for making all of these uses public, is, is to let others weigh in and see and say, you know, this is an issue or this is something. One thing that we're going to be doing is, is releasing all of 2020's numbers as well, all of those incidents, and anonymizing them with codes for the officers so that you can actually see which officers are involved in which ones. Do we see patterns of those? Not named, but, but codes that are, that are you know, uh, uh, consistent across. So that's, I think that, I think frankly, 
when we think of, of the, the multiple systemic issues that afflict our country and that have disparities across all of them, the idea that there are not upstream conditions that result in differences of, of behavior and differences in, in who officers encounter is, is not, doesn't make sense. Of course there are. Officers are the inheritors of, of a lot of things that this, uh, this country has, has faced and not faced well enough for, for 400 years. And so um, I think that there are, the question in front of me is whether or not when I look at a specific incident, I see something that is being done by an officer or officers that is, is perpetuating that or, or contributing to that. Or are we looking at a situation that is, uh, you know, a set of circumstances to which officers have to react? Thank you for that. Got another question in the in the room here. Uh, I think when you talk about being defunded, you have to realize that it happened not only because of George Floyd, but because of three horrendous incidents involving Burlington police officers. Right. And only one of those police officers is gone now, right? That's correct. You do a very fine presentation. And if we could all believe in the goodwill that you are showing here tonight and hope that, that this would work out, we'll still all wonder somewhere in uh, the backs of our heads about those two bad apples that are still in the police department. Mm. Do you have a... I was Sense. waiting for you. I, no, I, I don't know. really have a question so much as this all sounds so good what you've presented mm -hmm. and, and we can't help thinking that there are still some things in Pandora's box that are going to come out and bite us big time. Sure. Well, so uh, again, one of the things I think about uh, those incidents was that they were not shared with the public in a, in a fast way. Um, and they were shared with the public because of uh, a lawsuit for two of the incidents that happened in September of 2018. Um, and uh, I've striven to, I, I've str <laughs> I am striving to make certain that doesn't happen again by making them all public. I don't ever want that to happen. Um, I didn't want it to happen then. I arrived in October of 2018 after those incidents occurred, but I wanted very much to make those incidents uh, and the discipline that had already been meted out and the fair and impartial investigation that was done by external investigators that we brought in to be shared. The one that I have, uh, that I was here for, and that I issued the discipline for, I am on record of it. It's the only incident that is also settled in court now. It's the only one that I can really even discuss. Um, and that involved the incident at the hospital. Which um, was appalling. I'm sorry? That was appalling. I, I uh, disagree. I have the, the, what my, um, my, I have, again, it's a very long letter that is publicly available about that. Uh, the, the attorney general did a long investigation into that. Um, and while I did uh, issue discipline to the officer for the profanity, um, that officer uh, was, that, he was assaulted in that incident. And, and when an officer is assaulted, the officer is going to take the individual into custody, which he did. And then that individual was treated and seen at the hospital and treated and released by the hospital with... Uh, he was punched three times in the head, breaking two bones. It was... Uh, Bare knuckle fighting has been banned And we are, that's centuries. another thing. Well, that is... So he was punched, the officer was punched first. The officer was punched it first. Was a wild swing. The video shows a wild swing as opposed to the very. The officer was punched first. Punching. And what we are doing now actually is moving away from strikes. We are uh, working to have officers train in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and a number of other, uh, and, and a system that involves many more holds um, and uh, is, is much less about strikes. Because as you point out, yeah, strikes are. Uh, can be very dangerous and can be problematic. It was an older man whose wife was in the hospital on an emergency basis. 
you had your officer had to know that the motions were running out. The officer had spent the last 15 minutes working with the gentleman in order to get him into the hospital, see his wife, and had been left with a promise that the gentleman wouldn't up, act out again. And when the officer saw him again, uh, said, you know what, you are now, you're, you're being trespassed, you need to go. And then he was struck. Well, you can't strike profanity. police officers. There was a profanity. You can't strike police officers any more than I can strike somebody for using profanity at me. I think this uh, this conversation could could continue uh, maybe at another time. Yeah. So, um, any, any other questions in the in the audience? All right, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I actually, my Yumi, if I'm getting it incorrect, she was first, so why doesn't she go next? Sure. Okay, yeah, sorry, it's just alphabetical on my screen. Um, am I free to go? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. I can go? Yeah, please, Miami, go ahead. Um, to racial disparities, I would just I would beg to differ on that issue. Um, and also, I would like to ask why is it when, like, I'm not expecting that when there are low level crime offenses that, you know, there's going to be a response right away. But I can talk of three different instances where I know where people call the police and they, you know, they're not expecting to get a response right away, but in one instance, the response they, the response they kind of got was, well, who cares? We're not going to do anything. And then in another instance, which involves um, a vulnerable youth um, being um, messaged by a man who's about 60 years old, and there were messages and evidence of money being given to the child and just telling her that she, he loved her and nothing was done. And like I, I, I understand, I want to say that I do understand that you are understaffed, and that I'm not expecting that you respond right away. But to have no response, or to to act like it was a huge deal to respond to something, or to not have charges where I think there was there was enough evidence, and charges should have been warranted, because now this man is out in the community, and he has no charges. And I guarantee you that this man will, this behavior will happen again. And I'm very concerned for all of the, there, we have lots and lots and lots of vulnerable children out there. And I'm extremely concerned. Well, those certainly sound concerning to me too. I'd be happy to, to you can send me an email or I can, I mean, uh, my email is available on the city website um, to try to dig into these a little bit more and, and understand which the cases are. I'm not familiar with, with either of them. Um, no, and, and I, I, I hope you don't feel that I'm attacking you. But no, I, I don't at all. I want... Because one, because one instance led to a more severe crime where I had to go sit in a house with my friend's mother because that person kept coming back in order to keep her safe because because I wanted her to be safe and there was like the person who was her caregiver could not be there. I went and I sat with them so that they would be so that I felt that they would be safe. Right. You know? Yeah. So, so again, I'd be I'd be happy to try to figure out what these incidents were and then be able to talk with you about them more specifically to talk to determine whether or not there's a reason that officers didn't come back or whether that's not there is no reason and there's no excuse whether there's something that can be done about this case you're talking about with regard to the youth uh, and, a, and a person communicating with that youth or sending that youth money um, while that is upsetting what I just said is not unlawful uh, and, and so how you address a situation like that is, is challenging. We, we have a domestic violence prevention officer that can kind of move into that t territory. We have a youth officer um, who used to be one of our SROs. Uh, that officer also has uh, both training and, um, and avenues to be able to address a situation like that, which again, as I described what you described to me, so what I heard and what I just said is not it's not criminal to do that. So there has to no, be something I'm else. Not, I'm not, I, and I'm not accusing you of 
accusing the officers of doing anything criminal. No, 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 not the officers. I'm saying the the, the man isn't. The response to when that happened, and I understand. I can only go in generalizations because sure. I don't necessarily, I don't want to put their names out there like that because I don't know how uncomfortable or comfortable they would feel about that. Understood. So and, I and just, generalities of, of what I know of those situations. Right, and, and I, so I'm... I'm not, Saying that your officers did anything illegal, I don't believe anything illegal happened. Uh, no, I, I wasn't. Uh, thank you for saying that, but I wasn't saying that the officers had done anything illegal. I, I'm suggesting that that as described. No, I, I don't think they did, but okay. I think responses, from what I understand, I think the responses could have been better. I, uh, it sounds like that may be the case. I'd love to talk with you more about it specifically, so that we can not, so we can get past generalities. And then I wanted to talk about a personal situation that I was involved with this summer where um, I was coming home from, I, basically I was out by um, North Winooski, um, right by that, um, the, by the corner store and the pizza place next to where um, the Burlington Free Press building used to be. And while I was walking, I stopped to get a drink and I started hearing some yelling. And I went outside to see what the disturbance was, and I saw that there was two gentlemen engaged. Well, there was one gentleman that was beating on another person. And so I went back into the store, and I asked them to call the police. And they said, well, they won't come. So I then went out of the store after I paid for what I, you know, what I was going to buy. And I started yelling from across the street at, you know, at the gentleman who was doing the attacking and I'm saying, hey, I see what you're doing, but you need to stop. And it did stop because once I started yelling, people responded, but I'm just wondering why would the people in in the store think that the police would not respond to to something of physical violence? I, I, I can't entirely answer that, but I do know that our delayed response has caused people not to report things as many as often. And, and I said at the <clears throat> Ward 5 NPA, my final plea of the evening was that I, I want to reverse that. We may not be able to come at all times, but if we don't know what's happening, then we don't even have a picture of whether or not we're either doing what we're supposed to do or whether or not we need more of this kind of resource or less of that kind of resource. We don't know where to deploy the resources that we have. Um, I am currently trying to put more officers on foot, <coughs> excuse me, on Church Street and, and in the City Hall Park vicinity, but I do so at the expense of other parts of town. I don't have an, any given shift has five or fewer officers. That's for the 44,000 people and 15 square miles of the city. Uh, if, you, if you're a skier, I'm a skier and, <coughs> excuse me, something got in my throat. Um, the Madonna lift line at Smuggler's Notch needs six people to run it. Just the lift line, just the lift. And, and we have five people for the whole city, so. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, for, for those kinds of things, we, we, need, we may not be able to respond, but we need to know that these things are happening. And, and I implore people, anybody watching, uh, to, to call when these things happen, to continue to report, because otherwise we don't know what it is that we're facing uh, as a community. But with regard to delayed response, with regard to those things, I'd love to speak with you at length about those in a more one-on-one -on -one way. All right. Uh, with that, I think uh, there was Ben, right? Yeah, hey, Ben, you go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, first, uh, I, I think partly if, if I noticed something, I would tend not to call the police now, whereas you know, it was a few years ago when we saw videos of what happened in Roosevelt Park with um, police officers essentially um, almost attacking two kids, two tall young black kids who were having an argument. Um, and they, they, they attacked those kids and then tried to arrest them. They arrested the wrong person first. That person had to tell them he wasn't the right one. It was just, you know, if, if, I, if I noticed an issue, you know, mo it's, it's also part of the shifting of the way policing happened. 
because many things that police get called for do not require someone with a weapon and do not require someone with a weapon mentality, which is what ends up happening um, at least so far. Um, so I think that, I think that at least for me, that's why I would not, I would think twice before calling the police if I notice something, because many of the situations don't require someone who's going to, um, you know, beat someone up and take names and arrest somebody. It requires someone with um, some understanding and compassion and someone who can set some limits but not fly them. Um, and, you know, and likewise, the lack of um, morale in the police force recently, it doesn't really bother me, to be honest, because um, we're trying to shift the whole the way policing works. And people who are used to doing it a certain way, when people are, they're also used to being, you know, kind of in charge, and then a lot of people in the population of the city don't like what they're doing and are really angry about it, you know, it's not easy for people like that to take that and, and understand it. It's easy, they, they feel like people are putting them down and they feel like they'd rather be someplace where they can just continue with business as usual and so they have low morale and they leave. But that doesn't mean that we're doing the wrong thing. It's just a transition. So, um, so I would not like to have decisions made based on trying to keep up the morale of the police force, but rather decisions made on doing the right thing. Thank you. Uh, is that just a comment or is there a question? I think I was next. <clears throat> you got um, we are, we are like running definitely behind schedule. You know, the, the next item is scheduled for 740, but if it's quick, uh, please, uh, please keep it brief. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear that. Uh, he said that the, the, that they're running behind schedule. Um, and the next item was scheduled for 740 and it's 745. But if you have something, uh, he said to, you could go ahead. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be really quick. Um, um, this is Jeannie Waltz from the school board. I wanted to ask if recommendations made by the safety task force about eliminating SROs and replacing them with community justice workers was still on anybody's radar. And you know, I know that there are these new positions that have been created for the city, it has nothing to do um with the schools and i also i'm a little bit disappointed that um you know we used to access pilot funds I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with how those positions were formally um furnished paid for and i was really hoping that that funding would remain in serving the district obviously with a community justice center um representative and that is all so, so yeah <clears throat> so uh, what, what i can say about not that i'm sorry okay what i can not say not to forget us what, what i can say is that uh the school district never paid for the sros the sros were funded entirely by the burlington city police department uh the police department uh, paid for the sros um and those came out of out of our budget my budget um the uh, youth officer we have is one of our former SROs. We used to have two SROs in the schools. We no longer do. Uh, the schools had a host of different ideas about the SRO position um, and many of those ideas were not compatible with our current staffing situation. And so I reassigned that SRO to a youth service officer role because she has such expertise in working with, with young people uh, and in, in following up on youth issues. Um, and so she has a dual role now where she is both on patrol, but when incidents happen that have a youth focus, she will be able to respond to those. And that includes sometimes going to the schools when necessary. But we no longer have a presence in the schools. Um, I think that's a real loss. I think it's a tremendous loss to the school district and to students and to building relationships. Um, I think that even the, the survey that the, that the uh, task force did itself 
said that it was a small minority that wanted SROs out of the school system. Um, but that ultimately was not the decision that was made. There was a decision made that had a position where the school resource officers would have been required not to be in the schools, to be on call for the schools uh, in a way that was not compatible with my staffing uh, situation. I can't afford to have two officers just sitting at headquarters waiting to be called. I'm sorry. I, I think maybe you didn't get my question. Well, the I money part. The, but the I'm money part. Sorry. I, First of all, I want to let you know that I understand that the district did not pay for the police officers. Okay. I, I don't know. They were, my understanding is that it was pilot funds that came from the city budget. And when the task, when, when the safety task force came out with recommendations, they did recommend that the SROs be eliminated, but that a position that linked to the community justice center be now I know that that is happening now those two new community positions you're talking about I, I believe that those have some sort of relationship with the community justice center no at least sort of training and I'm wondering if that might be on the radar for the schools I don't know what is on the radar for the schools the officers weren't funded by any pilot funds. They were funded entirely through my straight regular budget. They were just two officers oh, okay. at, who we deployed. So insofar as any money that would go to some other role, that's not in the police department budget, nor would I be willing to spend police department money on such a role. With regard to the community justice that center, my CSLs... The Thank you for clarifying Sure. That. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So just before we finish up with the, the chief here, I'd just like to say th three quick things. First of all, I thank you for being here tonight because there's a long tradition of uh, chiefs of police of Burlington coming to the wards two and three uh, neighborhood planning assembly meetings specifically like uh, Chief Tremblay and yep. Ch Chief Sherling, even back in the day when um, uh, most of the other MPAs didn't have enough people attending the meetings to warrant that, but they still came to the boards two and three. So I welcome you for coming here and taking difficult questions. Thanks. The second thing is an invitation. So if you do have uh, officers who are being uh, sworn in, and if you have a ceremony in the past, CCTV, especially myself, have actually recorded that. So if you have any interest in, in the public actually recording some of the recruitment ceremonies with the officers and their families, uh, we'd be happy to go there and record that and broadcast it on channel on uh, CCTV time meeting. I would love that. So we just get we'll we'll, we'll switch uh, uh, public relations information or whatever. I am sending an email to myself so I will remember it because I okay. Would love that. And so the last thing is I just want to point out. Um, so earlier you talked about the police academy and how you had one officer going through it and there'll be more. So um, it's probably just a wild guess, but it's probably. That being a state organization, the, the academy, um, has anything changed at the academy as far as training is concerned? Because, see, that's a big issue here in Burlington. I'm not sure how big an issue that is anywhere else in the state, but you probably don't know much about that. But I just thought I'd mention that. I, well, I do, actually. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, thanks for, I used to come religiously to all the NPAs. I went to every NPA throughout the city uh, when I was a deputy chief and before we unfortunately had the pandemic. I love them. I love this one with the food. Uh, <laughs> I like the one in the south end because oftentimes it was at Pizza 44. I live in the new north end, so I liked going to that one because it was closer to home when it was over. But it, I, I liked them all and, and I, I really miss them. I really do. Um, sorry, we have food back. Yeah. Um, I am the chair of a subcommittee of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council that is working on entrance exam standards for the Vermont Police Academy. It was my group that ultimately got rid of the existing test that we had. We believed it to be unfair and unsupportable with regard to issues of equality and equal opportunity, and we are working on finding an alternative to it. Also, new standards for uh, PT and for the psychological inventory, as it is called, by Rule 16 of the state of Vermont. Um, the curriculum is also being overlooked.
overhauled there. And there's curricula changes that are the result of legal changes that have been made in Montpelier uh, with regard to use of force and different kinds of standards. There are others that are the result of the new director of the Vermont Police Academy, Heather Simons, a wonderful woman who's really trying to make changes down there. Okay. Um, so that's your short answer to that. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for being here. All right. So. Next up is, uh, is uh, the NPA bylaws. They've been in the works for a very long time. Um, you know, actually, since before I joined the steering committee, and probably Charlie has, has a lot of, uh, you know, the, the memory goes back a ways. Uh, it's been worked on for a long time and just put off, you know, the, the can getting kicked down the road. Um, but uh, every NPA has one. We have just gone without bylaws for a little while, um, and we, you know, we as a steering committee have really spent a, a good amount of time like talking about it and looking them over. And they are in the appendix uh, for anyone to review. Um, it's 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 very much a uh, just a guiding document. Uh, lays ground rules for meetings. Um, expectations and aspirations um, and it can always be modified down the road um, it, it's not uh, it's not a scary document it's um, it's just it's just a, a, a guidebook for running an MPA essentially with some with some rules um, yeah I, I, I don't know if there's I mean I, I know we put brief overview in the uh, in the description um, and I, I don't know how much further in depth uh, going would be would be helpful. So I think, honestly, with that, I think just calling a vote um, would be would be sufficient. So let's start with Ward Two, uh, unless Charlie. Why don't, just, why don't you just ask people in general online if they think there's enough people here to pass the Bible? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so so. I'm not. I haven't really looked at the at the at the lobby here to see how many how many people are actually present. Fifteen. Um, so just ask you know polling the audience here uh, for for a vote like this um, that concerns you know the NPA as a whole, um, both you know two, wards two and three. Um, I don't know what the spread is here. Like how many people are from ward two? How many are in three? Um, if we think as a group that this constitutes a quorum, or if we should just hold off until we maybe have a, a, a bigger in-person meeting, maybe even with a dinner, uh, hopefully, um, you know, that would be the option. I mean, we, we've operated without them for a long time. Uh, we don't need them. Uh, it's not, not like a requirement, it's not illegal. So um, yeah, just, just putting that out there. Any, any, uh, any thoughts, any, any Objections, just uh, you know, whatever you say, please keep it brief. We are, we are definitely uh, behind schedule. Any comments, any, uh, any objections, any, any suggestions? Uh, Hello, Kevin. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, do the bylaws, they should if they don't, do they actually specify what constitutes a quorum? They do, yeah, it's, that's in there. Right now, we don't. So like, it's just a judgment call by the group, that's why I'm asking, yeah. The bylaws, though, do include stuff about like what a quorum is, yeah. And we don't have them, right? We don't have, we don't have them? No, yeah we, we, yeah, we don't have any in place right now, no. So then we can't vote on them. Sorry, what? You said they do specify what's a quorum and we don't have one. Is that what you said? Uh, oh, sorry. I, I must have misunderstood you. Um, the, the, the bylaws do have stuff about what a quorum is, but right now we, are, we don't have bylaws adopted, so that, that rule isn't, isn't relevant here. That's why I'm asking the group just to make a judgment call if, if we think that this makes a, you know, it constitutes a quorum or well, if we should hold off. We didn't change it from the old bylaws, I don't think, and those are still operative until we adopt new ones, so. My impression was that we don't have bylaws in place at all. No. Oh, I see. Okay, never mind. 
Yeah. So like right now it is just a judgment call whether or not we think it's a quorum. And uh, I, I don't know what, how to move forward on this. Charlie, you want to you know, chime in here? What do, you th what do you think we should do? I mean, you know. Okay, some people on the steering committee felt strong enough about it that they wanted to, do, to move on this quickly. Or I shouldn't say quickly. They wanted to move on it tonight. My, my position on it has always been wait until there's another community dinner when there's 100 people in the room and then do it then. Right. That's my position on it. And that's fine with me. I, I, I could go either way on it. I'm just trying to be a, you know. I'm trying to go along and get along on this one. I, I, I really don't see the, 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 you know, the, the need for them. So like, I, I really don't care. <laughs> it's uh, it's fine, fine with me either way. Um, I don't know, I guess then let's, how about, let's do that then. So like steering committee members present and go from there. Uh, we have two hands raised. Hands raised. Just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you take your pick. Uh, Miami, I guess. All right, Miami. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Tony Reddington had some concerns, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what all of them were, but I do believe there was something about the takeover by, like, the mayor or somebody, and so I think we should keep that in the community when we make the decision. Tony, uh, a little clarity here. Tony, are you still with us? Yeah, uh, I don't have a problem, uh, Miami. I, uh, my, my questions got answered, uh, and, and I, I was merely a comment. We, we correct, we made the, the adjustments uh, at the last uh, steering committee meeting. I'm perfectly happy with the, with the uh, bylaws for Ward 3, and I'd be happy to see them adopted tonight. Uh, I, I think it'll be a while. Uh, uh, there, there, uh, first, it's true, there's no great rush. We don't have to do it tonight. Uh, but we've been, you know, this has been hanging around for years now. Um, and either this meeting tonight or next, next month, we should get it done. Get her, get her done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, any, any strong objection? How about that? How about, any strong objection to, to holding off and just kicking it down the road in another month or two? Until there's a bit more of a crowd, a more, bit more of a quorum? Uh, Jess has had Go ahead, Jess. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have any objection to putting it off. We've been operating relatively functionally without bylaws for quite some time. So I think putting it off until we can have more people in attendance makes a lot of sense. As long as we make really diligent efforts to make sure that sometime down the road, perhaps when we can meet in person um, or a larger group outside, that we actually do have a cool. large number um, and representation from the community. That sounds great. So, so waiting to make the effort to get more people there. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And uh, you know, I think uh, I think we came to a really good place with it, and I'm glad that we like, you know, didn't just keep kicking it down the road. We actually like reviewed it and talked about it, and like made made changes and you know really refined it. I think it's at a good spot. You know, so I, I, you know, really it is just going to be a vote. You know, um, and I, I I think that's that's progress. I think I think we should uh, at least give ourselves that credit. Um, so, anyone else have an objection or an opinion? No? With that, oh. moving on. Tony still has his hand up. I don't know if that's from before or whatever. Tony, no, do you have. No, no, no. Okay, I think that's a, that's a no. All right, so Pat, moving on. We are behind schedule by five minutes, so that's not too bad. Um, so, uh, JRMA design uh, for 111 North Ave, North, North Winooski Ave, rather. Um, they are here to talk about their, uh, their, their work, what, uh, what they got going on uh, for our review. Uh, do you, are, are they here? All right. Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Alphonse. JRMA Design Studio. Um, we were here a few weeks ago uh, to talk about a project um, that's upcoming in front of the Design and Body Board in the next couple of weeks. Um, one of the things we have to do, as many of you of the MPA know, is we have to come here, uh, show the project to you guys, make sure we get some input before uh, we go in front of the DAB. Um, 
We came last a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately, I, I didn't notice uh, something in the, in the MPA uh, requirements that I need to properly notice um, tenants that are residents who need to the project. So I'm back. I'm here. I want to, uh, you know, put the project in front of everybody again, make sure people have a chance to at least see what is coming in front of the MPA, uh, the, the design advisory, and hopefully DRV in the weeks and months to come. Um, so I'm going to share my project and, you know, take questions, just to give a general overview of, of uh, you know, where the project is located and what we're trying to do. So let me share my screen and we're going to go over here. So I don't have, um, let me do one thing. This project, let me start with okay. So this project sits at 111 North Venus Heats. Okay. Right in the middle of the block, uh, forgive me, I'm trying to remember the two streets that sort of sit uh, north and south of it, but um, there's an existing apartment building that sort of sits when is it from in? Oh, wait, can we say it? Um, there's an existing building that sort of sits in the front of the property. We're not touching this building at all. It's, uh, it's in relatively good shape. I think the, uh, the owner has put in some efforts to try to make sure it's, it stays that way. Um, behind the building sits a bar. Um, and this bar, unfortunately, is. And these are sort of some pictures of you know, what the barn looks like. Um, so this barn is being proposed to be taken down. And we are, myself and the owner, the, the owner uh, would like to develop six new residential units to be placed on the property. So with that, we are proposing so that's the location is, is right here where the barn sits. Um, and the idea is to replace it with a building that generally sits in the rear of the property with parking sort of pushed right up to the uh, right up to the building. Um, so nothing really changes up front. Most of the stuff ends up being towards the back. We're actually moving the you know, moving the, the project away from the lot line, which Currently, the barn pretty much sits along the lot line and really encroaches on this property. Um, as any of you guys know, and I think you know, I, I heard from the last in the last uh, MPA meeting, um, you know, this would be a great addition to the neighborhood in terms of uh, new residential units. Um, one of the units is proposed to be perpetually affordable uh, per the guidelines the city has put in place. Um, they're primarily, uh, there's two ground units that are two units. Um, and then up above, there's two more units, uh, or I'm sorry, four more units that have uh, bedrooms up on the third floor, four bedrooms on the third floor. Um, I'm sorry, there's two, there's four units, two bedrooms per unit on the floors up above. And, you know, it's, it's generally a pretty, a, we call it like a tight looking building. It's a, it's a rectangle with a, with a, a low profile roof, uh, shiplap siding. There's going to be a brick, um, you know, lower level. Um, you know, there's some staircases that kind of make their way up to the, to the second level to access those units. There's, on the lower level, there's affordable, uh, there's uh, handicap accessible units. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good building for this area. I think it fits in nicely with, with what we've got going on. And, you know, from the street, I don't think you'll see a tremendous, uh, you know, you're not going to be, the, the existing building is the building that's going to be noticeable from the street. I, I doubt you'll see much of this building uh, being so targeted. But, um, happy to take questions. I'm happy to try to answer as many uh, questions as I can. Um, I know there was a question regarding the, the barn last time um, about its historical relevance. Um, I, I looked into it a little bit. I couldn't find anything that uh, the city had deemed it 
um, you know, in any kind of records that the city had deemed it uh, a, a historical, uh, had a historical integrity to it. But just so we, you know, we're all on the same page, when we do go in front of the DRB and the DAB, to take down any kind of existing structure like this, we have to meet a, a number of guidelines that the city's, you know, the city's development review board and advisory board will have to take into consideration. Um, and I think we will meet most of those, if not all of them. Um, but again, I'm happy to take questions if anybody's got any or if you guys like it. You know, let me know if you guys like it. Let me know. <laughs> so. All right, cool. Actually, I have a I have a question. Um, you know, so so in your search, you know, I, I fully appreciate um, you know all the all the guidelines that you follow, and and it's all, it's all good. I'm I'm just genuinely curious, like, and just for just for documenting it, you know, for posterity, like, what did you find out generally about it? Like, what what's what's generally its story, like the the barn? Primarily, you know, any building that is 50 years old in the city from today automatically gets put under a review process uh, to determine whether or not it has historical relevance. Um, and there's a series of guidelines, um, you know, that even if, it, if the city, well, I think, at, I think at some point, the city does have some type of catalog of the important historical buildings within the city. Um, I think it's up to them to sort of notify the owners and let them know, hey, you know, this this building is considered historic and it meets a number of guidelines. It could be anything from a certain person that lives there or an event that's happened there. Um, it could be have characteristics of a certain type of architecture or um, have relevance to a particular event that's happened within the city. Um, it could have architectural details that um, that this, that are representative of a, of a type of uh, design that was relevant some time ago. Um, but I think all of those, that criteria really isn't being met by this bar. Um, right, but I, I, can, I, can I kind of just, so I, I, I really, I, I'm just trying to get at, so like you, you, you did research, right? You said, so like, I'm just trying to like, pull out like what you found out about it. Like, you know, was there, is there a story to it that's worth sharing? I mean, was it like a, was it a functional barn or was it just a shed? You know, like what, like, you know, w you know, was there a story that you found, like, did you learn anything about the thing or did you just see, like see like, yes or no, there's, it's protected under the historical preservation. You know, Gotcha. I didn't, I didn't, I, I must have uh, I, uh, misunderstood what the nature of like the research was. So that's the, that, that, that explains the, the mistranslation there. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering. Appreciate it. Um, any, any other questions? Uh, Cause I'm, I'm the MC. Any question? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Hi, it's Kurt McCormick. I, I live on North Michigan. Uh, uh, is, is the project um, just north of, of North Street? Yes, sir. Yes, I believe it. I think I know. I think I know the, the lot there. Um, uh, how many how many housing units in total? The total lot will end up having eight. Okay. Well, I, you're probably under 
a threshold, but in the um, energy code now, um, there, there's a threshold. I think it, it, it's probably 20 or more units, so you're probably under it. But um, uh, uh, requiring, um, if not uh, electric car charging stations, um, um, the means for doing that easily later. In other words, empty conduits and, and um, uh, whatever might make it a lot easier to, uh, I think empty conduits is what the code actually says, um, that you have to at least have. Uh, we do consider that. I don't think you're required to, but we do consider doing that. Um, I don't know. I'd have to have a discussion with the, the owner and see if it's something that is, you know, if, if we're going to entertain any sustainable options, uh, you know, looking forward on the property, um, I can talk to him about it. You know, I just can't, I can't talk on behalf of the owner and say, you know, we can we'll consider, I can, I, I don't really know at this point. It, it, well, let me put it this way. We haven't had a, we haven't had a conversation about, about that. And I, I think maybe because we don't meet that threshold either. I think if, yeah. like you said, if it, we, if we were meeting the threshold and the city has a guideline that, that says, hey, you know, be prepared, you know, you know, that we're asking to do this, um, yeah, well, we certainly have to meet the code. But at this it point, be, it, it could be a lot uh, less expensive if it's planned on, even if there is, even if it's not installed yet. You know what I'm saying? Yes, uh, it may, may not be that costly to provide for um, empty conduits for for the future uh, charging stations that you might someday want to put in there, and it would cost you less if you had already done that. But maybe I'll follow up with you later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Miami's had a Miami, do you have a question? In using the materials that you use, have you taken climate change into consideration when you're using the materials that you use? I think, in particular, the, the materials, I would say, most of the materials we get. Uh, I, it's a good question. I, I think I don't know. Put it this way: we, we have to move the mind one way or the other. Uh, you can't control the building one day. The reason that I ask is because it's going to become more and more of an issue, and we all know that that stone and brick retain heat, and so that heat is going to make the city hotter. And um, I saw a presentation somewhere. I'm not sure where where um, Burlington is a hotter city than because of our historical architecture that uses stone and brick. So that's why I asked that particular question. The only thing I'll tell you is that, you know, you know I'm a big believer in the idea um, that we're, we're sharing a lot. You know, down, you know, some folks have dense housing to this area. Hopefully more people use, you know, infrastructure you know, white. Uh, you know, to, to be able to commute to work um, rather than putting us, you know, 20 miles out and we can get there. Um, you know, but you know, urban heat index is a real thing. I guess I hadn't considered it with this particular property. And, but, no, I don't want you to think I'm mocking you, I'm not, but I'm just saying, uh, is it something that is on your, your radar, perhaps in the future? Because, I mean, they keep changing when it's going to get to the point of no return, but it looks like it's coming up within at least the next 10 or 20 years, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any, I, th I think uh, we're about ready to move on to the next section, unless, Charlie, you have a Just question? Just a quick question. Um, Kurt McCormick actually might know more about this than uh, the developer, but so the, the city is proposing taking parking off of one half, one side of North Winooski Avenue. Uh, do you think that this is going that if that were to happen, would that have any effect on your project? So to make sure I understand the question. If they remove parking on one half of the avenue, would this potentially be affected? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, removing any kind of on street parking uh, would not only affect this property, but everybody up and down North Tamuski Avenue. Um, but we need the parking guidelines that are currently sitting, you know, uh, 
that are we're, we're currently asked to meet. Um, so I think I think if, if and when that day comes, we'll have to address you know alternate means of making sure that we can get on and off this property you know well. I just, you know I think I'm a big uh, push on, on bicycle parking. Um, you know, and this project is relatively close to the downtown area, so I think it would service you know a lot of those you know a lot of jobs that uh, the downtown area has. Okay. So I, yeah, I thank you. I was just making sure you were aware of it, so that's fine. Thank you. All right. We, I mean, we're, as of right now, we're about 10 minutes behind schedule. Um, but, and, and also it's been past the 10 minutes like just for that section too. So um, uh, just the, the two people who have their hands raised, um, would you be willing to just reach out to the developer um, separately or you know, would, you, would you prefer to just do it, do it here? Uh, I would prefer to ask and if it's gonna be complicated, maybe they can answer it later. Okay, yeah, I'll leave it up to the developer then to, uh, to, to, to defer it if that's the case. Okay. So, um, I, I might have missed, you might have said this and I might have missed this because it's been very glitchy, but do you know what year approximately it was constructed? The barn, I have no idea. Um, I, can look up the, I can look up the database and, and check up the, uh, the house and get, and get you an answer. Okay, because um, I'm wondering, like, I know, like, for a lot of us, like when we have to do anything on our houses, like they, like for example, they make us in hundred year old houses, we have to put in wood windows, we can't put in vinyl windows. So, um, that, so I'm just wondering like if this barn is that old, you know, how come it's not being renovated into a development? And because it sounds like you're tearing it down, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we can talk more about it later. It's like, I'm wondering how old it is and like how we determine what are the things we preserve and what are the things we don't? Because it seems to be like, like private homeowners are held to a different standard than developers, you know? So. My only answer is um, the city does have pretty good guidelines on it. If you look at the Article 4 or 5 within the city's general bylaws, you find a, lot of pretty, a pretty lengthy criteria that could help answer some of those questions. But I, I'm happy to talk to you about off, off the, you know, via phone or whatever you want to do that in touch and happy to talk to you about it, so. thank you all right and uh who's who's the who's next uh my name put her hand down so i think she's fine to just follow her way unless you want to say something all right Hear, hearing none um yeah i, I hope uh miami you just uh, follow up with the uh, developer and another uh, another forum um Thank you. Let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, representative updates. Uh, who do we have as a representative? I know we have uh, Max here. Um, we have Brian China. Who else do we have? Oh, and uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, so rude. Uh, thank you for being here, um, uh, Michael. Uh, thank you for presenting and uh, for, for making the effort. I appreciate you. Sorry, sorry for, uh, for skipping that bit. Thank you, guys, very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Anyway, so uh, uh, we have Max and Brian. Who else is uh, Ethan? Who else do we have in the in the audience? Kurt and Emma. Kurt and Emma. Oh, Kurt and, Emma. and Jill's here as well. Hi. Awesome. Uh, so, Max, would you like to go first? Well, the the city councilors went first last month, so maybe the reps and can go first this month. Sure. All right. Uh, <laughs> sounds good to me. Uh, you know, work it out amongst yourselves. Uh, Brian or uh, Emma. You might if I go first because I've got to put the kid to bed. Yeah, go for it. Full rank is that? Go for it. Full of leg. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, Ruby, I want you to know Ruby thought that the bylaw vote was very difficult. I was asking her what if she thought that you all should vote, we should vote in person or vote in on Zoom. So I'm trying to teach her here. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to give a, a little bit of an update as we get closer to the session. I'm Emma Mulvaney Sanek, and I'm the state representative in the district called Chittenden 62, at least for now, which is the west side of the old north end, and then it goes up into the new north end to about Ethan Allen um, Parkway and Letty Park, and then all the way down to Battery Park, basically. Um, I wanted to just share uh, my sort of a 
couple of policy ideas for the 2022 session. Um, it really has a worker recovery theme to it. I'm working with a couple other legislators, including Tiff Greenlee here in Burlington, on a few pieces here. So it's really a collaborative effort. As, as anyone has, who's been paying attention realizes, the way that folks are um, returning to the workforce is all over the map, and it's largely because folks are really, you know, taking a stand for wanting to work for fair and livable wages and um, decent and and uh, decent and, and fair working conditions. So these are these ideas are kind of along those lines. Um, so a few of these bills exist in House General, which takes a lot of labor issues, but one is to um, really push for the minimum wage being $15 an hour by 2025. There is a bill now in, in the, um, in the yeah, House uh, that proposes that. And we, we, we were talking about including in that idea an elimination of the tip minimum wage. Vermont is one of the um, uh, most majority of states have still a tip minimum wage, which is a sub tiered wage, um, which if you look historically, has a lot of both um, sexist and racist roots to that policy. It was um, purposely designed to justify um, uh, giving a lower wage to folks who are BIPOC and the lower wage women and are, tend to be in the service industries that are tipped. So we would, if we were successful in that, we would join eight other states that have for a long time now not had a tip minimum wage. And there are lots of restaurants, if um, you start to ask around, that are actually moving towards one fair wage policy, uh, largely because they can't get workers to come back and work for a tipped minimum wage, a tipped system um, of compensation. Uh, the second general area along the same lines is to push for a reliable work schedule policy in Vermont. Uh, a lot of folks call it a fair work week. About a third of retail and service workers often have less than a week's notice of what their work schedule would be. And as you can imagine, that dramatically impacts folks who have young kids, who have childcare issues. Um, it also dramatically impacts folks um, just in terms of econ economic security. If their work schedule is unreliable, it's really hard to hold a second job or finish a degree or do much of anything if you're given very little notice. So it's a real economic justice issue and I think would bring a lot of stability to working people's lives to have a requirement of at least two weeks notice of what your work schedule would be. Um, just two other quick ones and I'll pass the mic. Uh, it would be another bill that's on the wall right now um, would propose granting workers just cause rights. Uh, right now, Vermont is an at-will employment state, so unless you're part of a union, United Workplace, uh, you can be fired for pretty much a host of reasons and have very little recourse. So this would allow folks to have um, uh, protection and the employer would have to have a good cause uh, to fire someone and would also just provide process around that. That would be incredibly helpful for folks who Frankly, there's a chilling effect when you, you don't speak up. You, you don't speak up if there's harassment going on, if there's discrimination going on, if you are afraid um, that you could be fired for, for much a lot of um, uh, different reasons. And so this would really protect a lot of, of workers. And the final one is on wage transparency. Um, this one is also sort of born out of the pandemic and helping and like hearing all these unemployment stories from folks. Um, one of the challenges of going back to work and applying for work is not knowing what jobs pay until you're very far into the work search process or the work uh, um, consideration process. So a few other states and cities have um, started to explore this, which would require employers to post what the wages are that they're offering in the job posting. It would take, it would um, rebalance the, the power structure if you're a job applicant of trying to guess what the, the wage might be if you even apply. It would help folks who are returning to work from unemployment apply for jobs and take, accept jobs that are actually going to meet their, their family's needs rather than um, uh, going through the whole process and then having to accept that job. It might be a lower wage because it's not you know, disclosed until the end of the process. So the combination of all these policies is really, I think, going to be. Um, a good step forward for helping workers recover from this pandemic and really put our economy back on track that would really center workers and what their needs are um, because it's, it's multiple pieces it's not just increasing the wage it's making sure there's justice in the workplace for folks and better protection for workers so i'll pause there and pass the mic and always happy to answer questions from folks you all probably know my contact information but i'll hang out for a little bit if there's questions thanks All right, so that would be, uh, is Brian, Brian uh, up next, I believe? I can go, um, I'll put my camera on, I'm trying to get this up. This like sad fan that's broken to work properly, but 
Um, so hi, I'm Brian Chena, I'm a state representative um, for 64. Um, I'm in the old north end part of that district, um, but it also is most of the east district. Um, I'm just gonna hold it like this. Okay. So, um, so um, the issue I want to talk about today is um, is recovery from the pandemic and, and the possibility that we can end homelessness as part of the process. When uh, the Sears Lane and encampment was uh, broken up, I'm sorry, is somebody else talking? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, um, uh, when when, the, when uh, the city decided to forcefully remove campers from the Sears Lane encampment, I went down and started talking to people who live there and hearing their stories and learning more about um, about the challenges that they face in their life that got them to that point, and asking them their ideas for solutions, and then started talking with various providers in the area, as well as other elected officials, and sort of processing all that info. I, I think that um, we really need to coordinate our recovery effort around a few pieces um, that center the social determinants of health. It's one thing I've seen as a, as a social worker is that the social determinants of health were impacted by the pandemic in a way that exacerbated pre-existing conditions for people who have mental health challenges and substance abuse problems, um, and it caused many new ones for people, which has flooded an already overtaxed healthcare system. And so in, in the, as we come out of this pandemic, we have to rebuild our healthcare system, realign our healthcare system, um, but also we have the opportunity to end homelessness by, by following through on the work that the state has already done. Um, for example, the 2016 um, white paper that talks about how to end homelessness in Vermont in five years. It's been five years and we haven't ended it yet. We've taken some steps in the right direction, but I'm hoping that, um, that I can work with my colleagues as well as impacted people like the unhoused people at Sears Lane to develop a plan that will rapidly build housing, as well as invest in workforce development and healthcare, agriculture, and construction, so that we can actually um, train people and hire them to build the housing we need, to work in the healthcare system and restore it, um, and to provide food year-round in Vermont. And ultimately, I think we need to guarantee every person in Vermont housing and food. Let's start with that that no one will be hungry and no one will be unhoused voluntarily um, or involuntarily. I mean. um, and, and then from the, by providing that foundation of support, we can then add other services and training to, uh, to help people um, harness their strengths. And instead of um, brushing people away and trying to make them disappear when they're, when they're at their roughest part of their life, we should be surrounding them with a circle of love and helping um, centering them and helping them bring them back into the community. And I'll just end by saying that, you know, I have this vision that one day, um, where, where the Sears Lane encampment is now, that there'll be a neighborhood that's been designed in partnership with unhoused people, where people of all backgrounds can afford to live. And that, you know, maybe in front of that building, there'll be a park that tells the story of Sears Lane and how at this moment in history, we woke up and we decided that we weren't gonna accept um, a society that, that discards people and treats them like they're nobodies anymore, and that this neighborhood was, the, was one of the many projects that happened in statewide efforts to guarantee um, housing as a human right for everyone. So thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, I can jump in and go next. Sure. That's all right? Yeah, please. 